Today's reading play with the metaphors of light and darkness, as well as a journey of great significance. In the ancient time of the prophet Isaiah, the writer imagines a day when his people shall return to their homeland in the light of a new age of prosperity and peace after having been defeated by their enemies and condemned to the darkness of exile for generations. Then Matthew's story of Epiphany also plays with both light and dark, with stars and infinite darkness, the cosmos in which new life is born. In Matthew's story lies another sacred journey. How might they be related? How might they diverge and each take us into significant places of discovery. As we listen to these sacred stories that shape our life of faith, may we ponder anew how we conceive of the light and the dark and the journey of the faith that we make by walking each day. So Isaiah 60, 1 to 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of Yahweh is rising upon you. Through darkness, Though, though darkness still covers the earth and dense clouds enshroud the people, upon you Yahweh now dawns, and God's glory will be seen among you. The nations will come to your light, and the leaders to your bright dawn. Lift up your lights, eyes, and look around. They're all gathering and coming to you. Your daughters and your sons journey from afar, escorted in safety. You'll see them and beam with joy, your heart will swell with pride. The riches of the sea will flow to you, and the wealth of the nations will come to you. Camel caravans will cover your roads from Medinan and Ifa, and everyone in Sheba will come bringing gold and incense and singing the praise of Yahweh. Matthew. After Jesus' birth, which happened in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of Herod, astrologers from the east arrived in Jerusalem and asked, where is the newborn ruler of the Jews? We have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay homage. At this news, Herod became greatly disturbed, as did all of Jerusalem. Summoning all the chief priests and religious scholars of the people, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they informed him, here's what the prophet has written. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, since from you will come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Herod called the astrologers aside and found out from them the exact time of the star's appearance. Then he sent them to Bethlehem after having instructed them Go and get detailed information about the child. When you have found him, report back to me so I may go and offer homage too. After their audience with the ruler, they set out. The star which they had observed at its rising went ahead of them until it came to a standstill over the place where the child lay. They were overjoyed at seeing the star and upon entering the house found the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and paid homage. Then they opened their coffers and presented the child with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, so they went back to their own country by another road. This is the experience and the witness of our ancestors of faith. May God's Spirit call us to follow the way of Christ today. Everybody. Ooh, you're all awake. That's even better. Right? Happy New Year, all. Happy, New Year. Happy beginning to 2020, a new decade out there. Aren't you excited? Isn't this a great, is this a harbinger of what's to come, I wonder? Uh, friends, my name is Reverend Matthew Fillier, and for those, anyone who doesn't know, uh, I'm the lead minister here at BUC. It's great to wish all of you Happy New Year, and as, uh, as was said earlier, thanks for getting here today. Uh, it is Canada, it is winter, and it is the beginning of a new year, and it always strikes me as a little ironic that we celebrate the beginning, a fresh start, a new year, 
in a very particular month. Can anybody tell me what is the saddest month of the entire year? Anybody know what that might be? January. January is the saddest month of the year. It is the auspicious home of a couple of titles, the January Blues, which is actually a clinical seasonal mood disorder that people really do suffer from, maybe some of you here today. today. It's also the home of the saddest day of the year. Anybody know what the saddest day of the year is? Oh, the 20th, close. It's the 20th every year, close, close, Nancy. And anybody guess what day of the week that might be? Monday. <laughs> Monday at 9 o'clock it begins. So you can put it in your iCal, your Google Calendar. Woohoo! Can't wait for Blue Monday in January. What a great way to start the year. You know, it could be worse. We could be in St. John's right now where they're getting like 50 centimeters of snow, right? So it's not all that bad. Uh, I'm normally pretty immune, I don't know about you, to the January blues. But this year, I felt it a little bit. I walked out of my house on New Year's Day in the morning. It's downright balmy. Every day in Nova Scotia is downright balmy to a Newfoundlander, right? It's just beautiful. I walked out, and my neighbors, they were all out too. And they were all taking down their beautiful, twinkly, wonderful, sparkly Christmas lights. All the decorations were going into cardboard boxes and Rubbermaids. Even the tree was in many a compost bin. And I thought to myself, my God, we're waiting all this time for Christmas. The light, the whimsy, the wonder of it, and it's all gone. So it's a new year. No, nope, we're into abject darkness now. Out with Christmas. It's all dark, all terrible all the time. I thought, wow, I really felt that this year. And I was walking the dog uh, later that night, as I often do, and I was looking up at the stars and feeling kind of glum. And I said, now why would my heart be sad about this lack of light? It is the season for epiphanies, and I had one myself. I thought, wow, we've never lived in a brighter time than right now. There is never, there has never been more light than there is right now in this darkest, most blue month of the year. There is so much light, most people living in a city can't even see the stars. There's just that much light, right? This is an example of a Nova Scotia evening. This is St. Croix. This is what your night sky looks like. How many people, when you look out the window, and unlike Nova Scotia Power likes to tell us, when you don't see salt fog, see this when they look out their window at night? That's our sky. Few of us know where, where to go to see it. Most of us don't see any of that because we are so convinced light is the answer to darkness. And darkness is that scary thing we just cannot have, right? We are almost drunk on neon as the answer to darkness we think of darkness as, you know, evil personified, as the devil himself. The bane of our existence is the dark, and the answer is just to have more and more light. We have so much light, most of us do not see that wonder of the night sky. Those stars are literally there, and we can't see them. Most people's night sky is the moon and a couple of spoons, the big and little dipper, few other constellations, but few of us realize all of that cosmos is above us all the time. There's just so much light. If Christmas is the passing of a season, and New Year's is the passing of a year, let alone the passing of a decade and the beginning of another, I kind of wonder about the passage of time today. You know, in the run of your day, the day that we all make by walking every minute of it, morning, noon, night, is there a time where your spirit feels a little more drawn to the divine, when God feels a little closer to you in your day. Maybe it's sunrise, maybe it's sunset. Does anybody have a particular time of day that they go, you know, yeah, that time. I feel a little more connected to the universe at that time in the day. Anyone have a particular time or a memory of a time of day that they love? They go, oh, Nancy, what is it for you? First thing in the morning, sunrise. Right when you get up, prayer. Anybody else? Sunrise? So this was great. Katie and I were having this, our minister of congregational care, Reverend Katie even, 
we were having this conversation in a roundabout way one day, and Katie was much the same. She was saying, oh, man, if you ever stay up and you wait to see those first beams of the sun break the hills at night, that is just the moment of feeling God's presence in your soul. Like, there's nothing like it. And I was chuckling because I'm the exact opposite. For me, it's twilight. I live for twilight. Like, there's nothing like watching the sun go down, and it just kind of bleeds across the horizon, all these incredible colors, paints this amazing scene, and if you wait just long enough, there's enough contrast for the stars to come out, right? That is just the most magic moment for me. And I thought to myself, these two things, sunrise and sunset, they're opposites, right? They're not the same. I kind of wonder about that. The wonderful word I want to remind you of today, and it's called liminal. And I think we're called to live in the liminal light. And why I think people of faith need to rediscover that word is this. So the word liminal in its Latin root means threshold. So it means to be in the middle of a process that's just starting. Another way of thinking about it is to hold a position on both sides of a boundary. And when I think of God, I can't think of a better definition. God holds both sides of the boundary of our lives, right? God is always in the middle of the process of unfolding. That's where the eternal is. That's where the infinite is. Not the clear sort of, this is the beginning, middle, and end, but always living, always changing, always growing. We're never quite sure where we are in that process, but it's amazing to be there. The word liminal. I think we're called to live in that liminal light. You know, Jesus, I think, preached about this when he would talk about the kingdom of God. Jesus would say, you're in it right now. You're in the kingdom of God right now. It's right under your nose, under your feet. And it's also not yet. It's also coming tomorrow, right? And it's also been coming since the beginning of time. It's all of those things living in the divine liminal light. The mystery of God's infinite is held in those small moments of dark and light, of day and night, of today and tomorrow, both. It's not an either or. You know, the story of Epiphany, as Paige was saying, you know, all about the wise ones following the star, and for so many of us, that's a treasured story of Christmas. And if it's going to mean anything more than a heartwarming tale that brings us back to Christmases of old, when we were yay high at the front of the church, many of us, if it's going to mean more than that, then it means that we seek the one who lived in the liminal light, where both light and darkness belong together. I think ever since I was in the womb, I've been singing Linnea Good's uh, epiphany songs, like Living in the Light, which many United Church people will know, or I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me right now. Um, Right? It's all about light. Christianity as a religion has been big on light. Light is good. Dark is bad. Don't go to the dark side, right? Jesus is the light of the world. And in some ways, Christian religion has kind of forced faith to be about people who live in the light of this one exclusive truth and answer. And everybody else who at all diverges from that, they're in the dark. They're ignorant, they haven't come to the light. They haven't seen the light just yet. And so we exile them to darkness. And it's kind of this binary way of thinking, right? I'm right, you're wrong. I'm light, you're dark. Right? I'm in, you're out. I'm going to heaven, you're going to hell, right? I think faith is so much richer than that. Like, that's such a trap that we still fall into all the time. It's like... Religion within Christianity has taken all of humanity's ignorance and suffering and isolation and fear, all of our violence and hatred, and we condemn it into the darkness, where coincidentally we also put the stranger, the immigrant, the person we don't understand, the person who's different and looks different than us, they also get put into the darkness. Darkness becomes, for many a person of faith, the exclusive domain where demons dwell, right? You'll never find God in all of her holy majesty and wonder with sparkly lights and angelic choirs singing alleluia in the dark. That's where the devil is. That's where the demons are. All the bad things that keep us up and go bump in the night are in the dark. 
I think in pitting light against the darkness, almost absolutely, we lose some of the wonder and the gift that is the darkness, the mystery of God. When you and I take a seed, that seed's planted beneath the soil, it's busy. It's living in liminal light. The process of germination has begun. We can't see that with our eye. But all of that is happening beneath that soil. And it's only when germination takes root and finally that fresh green shoot of Jesse breaks forth the soil that we say, there it is. But long before we saw it in the light, it was growing. There's a beautiful mystery of the darkness. It can't grow without it. Think of a child in a mother's womb in the safe warmth and darkness of being in utero. We lose that image by just insisting it's all light all the time, only light is good. My lovely Pentecostal mother-in-law, oh man, Hilda had the greatest observation the other day to which drove my father-in-law crazy. We were talking about nativity scenes, and Hilda was looking at all these nativity scenes in our house, and she says, you know, Matt, you're a minister. Why is it that we never see a picture of Mary actually giving birth? Like, he's always out. He's always just there. What's that all about? How come we don't have a picture of Mary actually giving birth? My father-in-law was rolling his lies and going, oh well, for God's sake, not today. And I was going, that's an awesome observation because that's that liminal moment, being in the midst of that process, that moment where life is on both sides of the boundary. We don't know which way it's going to go. That's not what we show. We show everything after it's safe and done and Jesus is okay and it's all good. That's what we want to see. Right? What's missing in that picture? A friend of mine who, uh, cancer is a part of both of our family's lives. We were talking about advances in cancer treatment. She was talking about being excited about the advances in mammograms for breast cancer. And we were looking at a picture, actually, and of a news story that was talking about it. And it hit me that an x-ray, the gift of an x-ray is, it turns your soft tissue dark. If you didn't have the contrast, you would never see the tumor light up. You've got to have the dark in order to actually see. That's the gift of an x-ray. Darkness is a gift from God. We need darkness to sleep, to heal, and as the wise ones remind us today, it's in the dark that we have those dreams that give us the courage to go home by another way. I love that line at the end of that story. Maybe we need to get home by another way, and the darkness helps us do that. This sort of Christian insistence on light alone has led us down some weary ways, I think. I'm the light of the world. Come to the light. I have seen the light. That quickly gets into an attitude of religious and cultural superiority, right? It's a very short stop before we start saying, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that when we profess to box God up into the light of a single answer, into a pit of deep intolerance, anti-Semitism, racism, and hatred, we more easily step. So often we treat light as being the infinite source of our peace and understanding and harmony. All that's good is light, right? Darkness is the scourge of our calamity and our suffering and our chaos. It's awful. And you notice who often talks that way? White societies and white churches and white churches, friends. Eternal light, if you had it all the time, eternal infinite light, we lift that up as like that's the halo that we want, eternal light. We would be blinded by the light. Yes, we would. I just aged myself. Um, but you would be. You would see nothing. It would be completely whitewashed. Nothing would have color. Nothing would have shape. There's no contrast. If you lived in eternal light, imagine your sunburns. You would never sleep. Every field of the earth would be dry as dust. Have you seen the wildfires this morning in Australia? We do not need eternal light, let me tell you right now. I'm being a little silly, but only just. So much happens in the light of day that we let slide. We talk about the light of day as being that moment of justice, of truth, where there's peace and understanding is always comes in the light of day. Well, there's a lot that happens in front of our eyes in the light of day that never gets named, that never gets called out, that never gets challenged. Just ask Lavinia Austin, who endures the most racist remarks 
while she's waiting in line at a Tim Hortons in Bible Hill because she's brown. She's just a proud brown lady trying to get a coffee. But the white people behind her are saying, can you believe this? There's more and more of these people living with us now. I know, it's like we live in Toronto. I'm going to need to go get a gun. That is Bible Hill in Nova Scotia. Not in the United States of America. She's just trying to get a cup of coffee. And no one in that lineup who hears the remarks says a word. Racism doesn't need light or dark in order to be racist. It just needs to happen in front of our eyes and no one need to speak to it to say, whoa, 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 back the bus up. Let's just take a breath here and think about that, right? How can we think and talk differently as a community? Come on now. No one says that. A lot of what is called darkness is happening right before our eyes in the light of day. And faith has nothing to do with light or dark very often, but with who knows what time it is and whose time it is. The wise ones in the story, they live in liminal light. They need the dark in order to see the star that guides their way to their destination, to the Christ child. And it's also that dark and light that leads them home by another way. Jesus and Mary and Joseph live in the liminal light. Right? Herod finds out about this threat to the dynasty of his rule. And what does this what does this ruler do but orders the death of firstborn children? Because he doesn't want to ever be challenged or his family to be challenged in holding power. It's Jesus and Mary and Joseph who escape under the safety and cover of darkness that gets them to Egypt. Without it, they would not be alive. They know what time it is. They know whose time it is do we. You know, Christmas... We often say more than any time of the year, right? Christmas has got to be the merry, holly, jolly, folly of all our spirits being turned up to 11 all the time. And we've got to keep everything merry and bright because this is the happy time of year. You've got to be happy now. You, you hear that? Be happy now. This is the happy time, right? No wonder January is the saddest month of the year, right? No wonder because we act as if we can't feel two things at once. You can't be happy and sad at the same time? Of course you can. It's called being human. The idea that you have to be only one emotion, the idea that Christmas must only be a happy time, is a prefabricated production that is not human or divine. It's just cruel. No wonder our culture has the reaction it does in January. You know, my Christmas tradition often goes quite a bit like this in how I think about Christmas and the New Year. So this year I have the gift of a four-year-old child. So really this is Isabel's first Christmas, right? The one that she really knows what's going on, right? So we get up in the morning and Papa and Nana slept over and it's Winnie, our dog. It's her first Christmas. Isabel is just ecstatic. I know, you're finding that all hard to imagine right now. But she's really just full of it. I mean, bursting with joy and wonder and curiosity about what the day is going to hold. And I am just, oh, so privileged to watch this little person come alive in this way as a parent. I'm just crying in front of the Christmas tree. I'm a hot, weepy mess, right, watching this happen and her joy. And as my heart is bursting with joy, it's breaking with grief. My mom died when I was 10. She never had any idea that Isabel would ever be in this world, and she never will. My dad died a couple years ago of pancreatic cancer. He never even got to hear her say her first word, let alone to be a part of a Christmas with her, and never will. Both at the same time, light and dark, pain and healing, joy and sorrow, one is not evil or good. They are both gifts of God. We feel more than one emotion at one time. It's called being human. It's a beautiful thing. I wonder if our New Year's resolution might be to try to live in that liminal light. The one we follow is not just God of the light, but also God of the darkness. And both are needed and wonderful. I think in 2020, in this new decade, with everything we're watching going on, that might just be the kind of face 
that could lead us all home by another way. And all the people said, Amen. Every soul's a sailor rolling on the deep. The tinker and the tailor, the beggar and the thief, the winners and the failures, the shepherd and the sheep. Every soul's a sailor rolling. to walk out here after that. Wasn't that amazing? This morning, we'll take our offering. One of the things I will remind you is that we have the plate going around, and sometimes you'll see the hands waving across the plate, and that's to tell you that our PAR members have given by way of automatic withdrawal. Today, I also would tell you that we are a grassroots church that is completely dependent on the generosity of the people who love being this church together. And to remember that without you, there would be no BUC. So thank you for your offering. Let our offering begin. And as our offering is received, we'll sing one of those hymns that Reverend Matthew talked about. It's all about the light.
We accept these offerings today in the name of the Holy One. Help us to use these gifts given by sharing and enhancing the life and work of our church. Amen. The community prayer that I've written this morning is as follows. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, we know that you are the light that guides our feet. You are the map that gives us direction. You are the peace that makes us strong. You are the patience when we are frustrated. You are the comforter when we are overwhelmed. You are the guide when we are confused. You are the wisdom when we are uncertain, and you are the endurance when we are tired. You are the inspiration when we are out of ideas. You are the energy when we are weary, and you are the peacemaker when we are hurt. God, hear our prayers, the prayers that we have prayed here today for ourselves, our families, and our friends. The prayers that we have prayed and continue to pray for those in the world who are facing difficulties, regardless of what those difficulties are. You are the inspiration. You are the energy. You are the pacemaker. Bless us one and all. Amen. If I was to give a toast for New Year's, this is what I would say on behalf of us all. Dear God, the New Year 2020 has begun. And as a community in prayer this morning, please give to us all joy, to fill our days, peace to fill our hearts, and love to fill our lives. May 2020 be a wonderful year for us all. Amen and thank you. Let's rise and sing together. big reminder from Jennifer, please stop in the front foyer and pick up your envelopes for your taxation of 2019, very important. I would also like to thank everybody here who has assisted with the service and you especially for braving the weather. A special, and I can't say it enough, a special, special thanks to our musician. Thank you, George Hubert. <laughs> And I'm sure Rick is going to invite him back, or we'll pray for that. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe, drive carefully, and we'll see you again. Amen. <laughs>